Hello and welcome to the Circus Research Webinar Series. Uh, we've been continuing this series and now we are actually in the flood week that we have different kinds of flooding um, presentations has been doing. The, on Monday, we had like uh, Dr. Shin Nishan's like extreme precipitation in the river and flooding uh, presentation. And now we have Dr. Yan Jia with us. Dr. Yan Jia is also a circuit stock researcher that specializes in physical oceanography. Uh, he studies the physical processes from estuaries to continental shelf with numerical simulation and field observation. He's also interested in ARC interaction and wave current interaction. Before we give the floor to him, just to remind you a couple of webinar logistics. If the sound seems like muted, you can just like try to increase the volume during his presentation. And if you have any questions, uh, please type it onto the chat box to the all panelists or a Q&A box. And then we'll try to answer them uh, as much as we can at the end of his presentation. Thank you so much for joining us. And Dr. Jia, we are listening to you now. Thank you, Aparang. Hi everyone, uh, today I'll talk about the simulations of tides through a narrow inlet at Guilford, uh, Connecticut. So uh, our study area is uh, related to a salt marsh system in Guilford marked as the red circle on this uh, map. I zoom in to see more details. Like uh, this salt marsh in uh, Guilford it has an area about 110 acres. It's only connect to the open water through a, a 16 feet wide inlet. And to the north, there's an, another extra 60 acres of pond connect to the salt marsh through a railway bridge and a culvert. So you can see the, in this situation, we have a relatively small coastal structures controlled uh, relatively vast areas of salt marsh. Like we can ask a lot of questions about, uh, for instance, like how the daily uh, tidal flows load the nutrients and uh, sediment to the salt marsh, and or what if the under st storm surge conditions like uh, super hurricane uh, Sandy, the floodings over over the salt marsh and over Road 146, which is the flooding is a problem for the local residents for the past ten years. So. Um, Let's see more details about the salt marsh. Right uh, here, we have uh, I'm showing two satellite images showing different uh, tidal processes, like during advertise and flood tides. You can see during advertise, the whole salt marsh are dried out. The water only left over uh, the tidal tidal creeks. But during flood tides, there's a large areas of salt marsh are submerged by water. And remember those waters are all coming through this narrow inlet. If we, we zoom in to say, you can tell immediately the current at the inlet are very strong. It's easy to imagine that the, because such a high volume of water only enter in or out through this narrow inlet. Um, I see some field pictures. This picture showing a flooding tidal conditions uh, last summer. Like you can see at the left side is the open water, the right side is the salt marsh. There's a sharp contrast of the water levels. Also, you can tell the current entering through the inlet is very strong. So the main question I want to ask you is, how does the inlet impact the tides in this salt marsh system? So we first uh, show some observation results. So on the lower panel, you can uh, you can see a, a satellite image marked the uh, field environment location. The blue is outside, the red out is inside water level sensors. So we have a relatively one month long measurement of the water levels during last winter. And you can tell like the water level of the tidal amplitude inside of the salt marsh is about a third smaller than the water level variations in the outside. So if you zoom in, you can tell besides the tidal amplitude reduction, the high tides in, in, inside of the salt marsh always about one hour behind the, the high tides in the outside uh, open water. So there's uh, also tidal phase-like. 
Based on these two, you can tell this narrow inlet has a strong constraints to the tidal flows in this salt marsh system. Um, but these are just uh, field observations. We are more care about, or we are more curious about, can we predict this in the future? Um, in order to do that, uh, we usually use hydrodynamic models. Here are listed four uh, well-adopted models people used in the coastal simulation. They are ROMS, AFRICOM, ADSERC, and SCISM. Um, for ROMS, it used rectangle grids, like, but its grid usually cannot vary large. But for the rest of three, we use their grid type called unstructured grid, which means like they can have very coarse resolution of grid uh, in the open water, uh, in the sound, but has one very fine resolution, uh, for instance, in our case, around the inlet regions. So they, they allowed you to have a large flexibilities. So that will save your computational time. For all the four models, in, in my test, I'm using the two dimensional circulation model, uh, which saves a lot of time compared to 3D simulation, but still it can uh, provide accurate uh, water level um, predictions. So the first step is to evaluate which, which, or, or which model is more suitable to, to be used in the prediction model. So in order to do that, I first test them based on an idealized swimming pool model. The swimming pool have a kind of a three meter depth with two, with two jetties set in the middle, which forming an inlet. The inlet has a length of 15 meters, but the, the width can vary from five meters uh, gradually to 15 meters. Uh, the tides are forced from the left side with one meter uh, amplitude. Uh, it's a semi diurnal tides, like with a period of uh, 12 hours. We run all the models for 24 hours. We cut off the first half. We only analyze the last 12 hour result. And we have four different models. Let's see the details about these four models. Uh, on the left, I'm showing a zoom in. A detailed plot of the grid structure on this blue, small blue uh, grid, uh, rectangle. So for, for Rome's grid, it's using rectangle grids, and the grids contain these two big jetties. But for the rest of three unstructured models, like they are using triangle grids, without the, uh, the jetty contained in the main model domain. For FVCOM, I have an extra test to see the performance of if what if we introduce the jetties into the uh, modeling domain. And for schism, we have another one. Uh, instead of using the regular right, right angle triangles uh, in the in inert part, I'm replacing the old uh, grid structure with equilateral triangles. So let's see the performance of all the four different models um, simulate the water level, uh, water levels. So on um, this chart, I'm showing a tidal sea uh, uh, through a whole tidal cycle, the comparison of water levels inside uh, in red color and outside in blue colors. So uh, the first row showing the case from Ron's test, we have five meter, uh, 10 meter and 15 meter uh, ways of inlet. So you can tell like for five meter narrow inlet, the, the constraints on the tidal amplitude inside of the salt marsh is very strong. The tidal amplitude is largely uh, reduced. But when you gradually open this inlet until it's uh, 50 meters, the water level difference be between inside and outside are nearly uh, negligible. Right? So that's the ROMS result. So for ROM, for Africa, uh, when you widen the inlet, the pattern are similar compared to ROMS. But if you compare between the two models, you can tell like for the five meter narrow inlet case, the difference, the constraints between ROMS and Africa are different. Africa has less constraints than ROMS. 
for add circ, the constraint is even nicer, right? The difference is much smaller. But if for the FVCOM case, if we introduce the two jetties back to the model domain, the constraint is equivalent stronger as the ROM's case. So it's quite different. Right? For schism test, we have two results. Um, the gray dashed line is a result with right angle triangle grid. The right dashed line is a result with equilateral triangle grid. So the the right one, the equilateral triangle grid has stronger constraints. Uh, the reason is um, there's a term called horizontal added viscosity, which uh, is an uh, important term. I will discuss it later. Um, is the way recording it in schism is based on the assumption that uh, the grade is equilateral. So that's why it performs better than a uh, right, right angle triangle grade. So, so we see here we can we have a lot of uh, result, but the one big question we want to, you you can ask is why you have the same five meter narrow inlet, but between the models they gave different results. Let's dive into the details. Okay, on uh, this plot, the left of, uh, plot, the x axis is across inlet distance. We, for instance, here we have five meter wide uh, inlet, and the x axis is along inlet current uh, current speed. So for most of the case, they have this curved shape, right? For instance, the ROMS case, we have strong current in the middle of the inlet, but when uh, approaching the two banks, the velocity reduced. We have this uneven distribution of velocity. We call it lateral shear. So for most of the case, uh, between the even different models, they have this lateral shear. That, that's one exception. That's the African case. There's no lateral shear in African result. All the velocities are, are the same in, uh, in the, across inner directions. What's the, what's the real situation looks like? If you can look at the picture there, you can immediately tell that there are definitely some lateral shear exist uh, in the real, real life, right? So let's see what's the momentum balance with lateral shear presence. We use a, a example from Rom's result. On this uh, plot, I'm showing through one tidal cycles momentum balance or the fo forcing balance at the right at the middle of the inlet is always the pressure gradient force balanced with horizontal added viscosity. Let me explain these two terms. So we have a field room. Um, we have a cartoon based on the field picture. So the blue plots uh, explain the pressure gradient force. Along, you can see along the, the blue, this blue line, we have water level drops. This water level difference between inside and outside the salt marsh will generate a pressure difference. We call it a pressure gradient force. This force is balanced by horizontal added viscosity. Uh, what causes the horizontal added viscosity is from the presence of these rocky banks. They, they will slow down the velocities. And this velocity difference from between the middle and the uh, coastal water will generate lateral added mixing. This added viscosity will balance the pressure gradient force. That's the momentum uh, dynamics for the cases with lateral shear. What if we ha don't have lateral shear? Like for instance, the African case. Let's see another detailed plot. So on this plot, I'm showing along inlet profiles where these black bars indicate the location of the inlet. So you can see or Rome's case, or African with jetties, both cases are, have the lateral shear. Their water levels dropped linearly through the whole inlet. But for African case, if they don't have lateral shear, 
there was a lot of drops in the in the pattern of a kind of stairs, right? The sharp drop of water level only occurred at both heads of the inlet. Inside the inlet, the water level are flattened. Same, same pattern showing in the velocity plot. They have uniform velocity inside the, the inlet, only have sharp change right at the head. Let's see the momentum analysis. So through the whole tidal cycles, the momentum balance still between pressure gradient force and horizontal eddy viscosity. But in this case, without lateral shear, the generating me mechanism for horizontal eddy viscosity is different. Let's see from the field pictures. So you can see the water level in this scenario is, is not immediately drop right at the rocky heads of the inlet, but the water level drops a little bit of, uh, upstream of the inlet, it's already the water level drops. That will generate a pressure gradient force, the water level difference, right? Also, you can, you can imagine like along these this right curves, the velocities, the flows enter into this, this uh, strong current is, is, is small, relatively small, right? The flow speed is slow. But once it enter into the uh, inlet, the current are very strong and it will keep uh, st this steady speed through the whole inlet and with no lateral shear. This uneven velocity changing will generate a horizontal eddy viscosity to balance the pressure gradient force. Okay, for, for both scenarios, with or without lateral shear, the momentum balance is between pressure gradient force and horizontal eddy viscosity. You may ask why we, we care so much about this momentum analysis. Um, so with the momentum analysis, we can simplify uh, the models. Like all the four models I'm showing, they, they, they all are two-dimensional time-varying problems. You need kind of uh, use a supercomputer to run one to two hours to get those results. Uh, because you are running, you are running a testing case with three, uh, a group of three equations. But once we know the knowledge of momentum balance based on this numerical simulation, we can simplify this two-dimensional uh, problem to a two-point time-varying problem. We simplify the equations only to only one, and we can finish a simulation in less than 30 seconds on my own laptop. Let's see the performance of this simple model. Okay, um, the, I'm not going to talk about the details of how to uh, how those uh, different variables represent, but you can see the performance. The right dashed lines uh, indicating the result of the simple predicting model, and the blue curves showing the uh, hydrodynamic model result of the water levels inside of the salt marsh. You can see these two, uh, the prediction model matched well with the complex hydrodynamic model for both scenarios with or without lateral shear. That's why we have uh, two sides of alpha here. So they perform well. Then the next step, we want to evaluate the performance of this simple model compared to our field observation. Here I'm showing uh, the comparison between the uh, uh, water level measured inside of the salt marsh uh, with a simple model with lateral shear assumptions. Uh, you can tell like they, um, they kind of overlap with each other very well, uh, which indicate the pred simple prediction model works well. There's only 15 centimeters kind of uniform bears uh, between the observation and the model. It says that it's, it's, it's near perfect. And it's easy to hand, this simple model can be easy to handled by uh, other coastal engineers and it's less uh, computational if uh, expensive. So yeah, yeah, that's that's the main result. We see what we gain from this uh, research. As both the field observation and the model study show that a narrow inlet has strong constraints on the water exchange 
between uh, uh, basins or salt marsh. Uh, we evaluate four hydrodynamic models, ROMs, FVCOM, EDSERF, and SCISA. And, and this, our result can be applied uh, to the future model simulations to guide the model selection and the grid design. And the physical funding, uh, the, big, the major, major big physical funding is the horizontal added viscosity plays important roles to balance the pressure gradient force. Uh, which is important in the small scale process. 